Good, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to another session of Office Hour. This is your time where, as a member of the association, you can come and ask whatever questions you got. Tonight, we're doing something a little bit different, a little bit uh, special for all of you. And so for those of you joining us online, that's great. For those of you who's here in the classroom, that's awesome. Uh, well, I've got a special guest with us tonight. And so Scott Hamilton with Proposal Helper is here with us tonight. And we're going to do uh, office hours where we're going to address proposal writing. And we can talk about anything else as well, but I want to uh, introduce everyone to Scott Hamilton with Proposal Helpers. And Scott, uh, if you can unmute your phone, I mean your uh, computer, go ahead and introduce yourself for a few minutes, and then we'll open up the floor. Office hours is a time where members of the association can come and ask any questions they want. Tonight, we want to lean a little bit towards the proposal side, but if you have questions outside proposal writing, or anything like that, that's fine as well. So, Scott, go ahead and uh, take a few minutes, share a little bit about yourself and, and how you got, uh, how you became a proposal writer and, 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 and what you do at Proposal Helpers and uh, introduce yourself to the group here. Okay, can you hear me okay? We can hear you okay. All righty, well, terrific. Um, so, yeah, my name is Scott Hamilton. I work for Proposal Helper. Um, we are a company that provides um, proposal support to a variety of different clients, um, a lot and a little. So we go from you know the whole nuts to soup. Um, I've been working on proposals in one way or another for about six and a half, seven years or so, um, predominantly in defense in the federal market, although I've touched on some other things um, kind of at the state level or municipal level. So that's sort of where I come uh, to proposals from. So I'm curious, how many how many people have you got there in the classroom? So there's uh, four of us here. Okay, and great. Let me check online to see if there's anybody else online. None yet, but we have five people registered online, so they'll probably join us when they get there. <laughs> well, it's dinner time, right? So we're competing with uh, mm -hmm. dinner. So I don't know if anyone there has any questions or wants to, you know, start the discussion with a query of some kind, but I'm here to serve. Okay, so uh, part of the reason why we asked Scott to uh, be with us here for office hours tonight is Scott and uh, Carolyn, they're going to be here this weekend or Friday and Saturday to do the proposal boot camp. And so we thought, you know, since we got him they're joining us this weekend for two days. You might as well go ahead and use today to address proposal a little bit for some of you who's not going to be there, and then for those of you uh, that's going to be there, uh, you can kind of get a precursor of what's going to happen this coming week. Uh, so, all right, so let's open up the floor. Um, questions, if you're online with us, uh, you can chat, type in and chat uh, in the chat area your questions. For those of you who's here in class, type in your, or, or let me know your questions, and I've got a mic here. It should be able to pick up your question pretty well. So, question for anybody. Oh, yeah. um, when you um, are going to be doing a proposal, mm -hmm. is it always going to come out as an RFP a request for a proposal, or do you just, or the times you just do a proposal and send it in based on? What it is that you're, you know, trying to, what, what type of award you're trying to win? Okay, so the question, Scott, did you hear the question? Yeah, I think I did. She asked, is it always going to be a proposal submitted to try to win a contract? Is that, is that what the gist was? Yep. So a lot of that depends on uh, the vehicle. So if you're on, usually if you're already on a contract of some kind, like a GSA schedule is technically a contract. Um, Depending on that vehicle, you may respond to a number of opportunities. Um, on the whole, though, yeah, you, you submit a proposal to go after a contract. That's the normal, you know, that's nine, the 90% case. Uh, the other things that we prepare proposals for are either for unsolicited proposals, so there's no RFP involved. It's simply a, hey, I understand you need these services, and I happen to provide them, and, and here you go. Or... Um, some people will call a, a uh, response to an RFI a proposal because it has many of the same attributes. And depending on the RFI that the government or the client puts out, um, it may address many of the same things. And they range from 
just give us your general capabilities all the way to all of the ingredients of a proposal to include price and cost, et cetera. So um, I don't know if I fully answered your question, but um, generally speaking, yeah, that, that's what you write proposals for, and they almost always require them in one form or another. Okay. Okay. Hmm? Henry? My question is, you know, me being new in the proposal business, is there a special, like we call governance here, a special language that I need to be aware of when I start looking at proposals so I know that this will fit me or this may not fit, I may be wasting my time because I need some language in there that didn't fit my, what I'm, I'm trying to do. Is there a special, I guess, some sort of assistance that you can get to understand what special jargon you really need to pay attention to? Okay, so the question is, uh, are there anything unique or special, any type of verbiage or language that you need to be aware of so that you can be, you can respond appropriately to projects? Okay, okay. Um, that's a great question, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to answer it in the general cases. And I, I would preface this whole discussion with, for everything that I say, there are lots of exceptions, and they range from 1% up to 50%. You know, it, there, there's a lot of variance out there because there's so many different clients, and so many of them operate under very distinct and different rules. So, yes, there is a lot of groups of terminology that you should become familiar with along the way. Um, the first is contract language, and that's not terribly different than standard uh, lawyer language. So understand the difference between um, an estimate and a, uh, a bid, um, or a, you know, an, the difference between an offer and a statement of capabilities. Because sometimes in our head, they may be the same thing. One saying, hey, I could do this for you, and the other one brings with it that plus, and I'm entering into an, a binding relationship. I'm making a legal commitment. So, yeah, you should very much um, study contract language. There are a lot of um, materials out there geared specifically toward uh, what they call contract math. So understanding um, the components of cost and price elements and what they mean. Because it's a, I myself might have this definition for what is or is not overhead, for example. Um, and some business owners can be very creative with what they decide is and is not overhead. Um, the government, and depends on which state, uh, certainly the federal government has its rules for what it considers overhead. And if you violate that, you know, that could be a, a problem. And it might be a small problem, a hiccup, and it could be a legal problem at the very, you know, the far end of the, uh, of the scale. So, yeah, I would make a study of that. It's not rocket surgery. It can be learned. It doesn't take years and years, but it does take... Um, a focused approach. Okay, so can you elaborate on overhead costs? Did you catch us, Scott? Can you elaborate more on overhead costs? So, and, and I will tell you right now, uh, in, in, in all candor, I'm not an expert on cost and price. That, that is my, in, term, in, in, my, in my own um, background, that's, that's why I've worked on the least. But overhead costs are going to include things like your rent, your utilities, uh, taxes that you might pay, um, any of many different costs. And sometimes it may be the same thing, but applied to one thing, it counts, and applied to another, it does not. So it's, it's quite complex, but it includes all the things that you need to do your business. Okay, so I have one other question. I'm looking at something right now with FEMA. They want all these products. There is nothing in the solicitation that mentions, uh, you know, where you actually need to put, consider things like, uh, um, when I guess you would add shipping in there into your, the cost of your product, but then also they want it to, all, to be uh, packaged certain ways and things of this nature. How do you, how do you actually add those things in if there's not a line item for them. I mean, you know, you sit down and just really count the cost of doing a contract um, or trying to be awarded a contract. Well, that's a great question. And um, to try to answer it, I'll, I'll try to answer it at the macro level and then at the micro level. So ideally, because those calculations are critical to whether or not you can make money, um, if you're selling um, 
a, pro a product to FEMA or anybody else at a given price, the conditions of delivery can have a huge impact. You know, if I'm selling you a pear at a farmer's market, that might cost you 25 cents. If I have to package it up and freeze dry it and send it to the moon, that same pear is going to cost me a lot more to deliver. And obviously, I'm going to have a business failure if I don't factor that in. So, for example, with FEMA, it's a federal government organization. Within their RFP, they're going to quote any number of federal regulations. And you got to read the whole thing. And it could be a huge solicitation, 125 to 300 pages. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them, um, they're going to assume that the vendor or the, the, the contractor understands all the details and is just going to throw it out there. And that's where you have to do your due diligence. And at the micro level, technically speaking, that should already be done long before someone decides to write a proposal. Because as I said, if you don't, you have to understand the conditions of the contract before you can decide whether or not you can make money doing it. That's just business 101. And only after you've made that decision that yes, if I won, I could make money or I would make money, only then should you be investing in a proposal. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does, but the thing is, the FEMA is throwing these out here now because of the hurricanes. They give you three days, seven days, you know, you don't have a whole lot of time to prepare what I consider to be properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just part of you making a business decision. As to whether or not you feel yeah, like you can handle it. Correct. And uh, if you want to jump through hoops to get it, you do it. If you, if you think that you don't have enough information to make an informed decision, then maybe hold off on it. And FEMA is a little tricky because they want it now because of emergency disaster relief purposes. Mm -hmm. So you know you just have to think through. You know, are you willing to take the risk not knowing all the information? I would add to that that in in the case of say FEMA and let's say Houston for example, um, there are rules and regulations that allow the federal government when they declare an emergency to waive various requirements. Uh, it was in the news before about uh, in Puerto Rico, um, there was a, a regulation about ships coming into port, et cetera, that they waived for a certain period of time to facilitate uh, relief operations. So in that kind of a situation, what I would do, if you have a product and you think it could help and you think you could make money on it, I would reach out to the contracting office and open the kimono and say, look, I am a great provider of the thing you want. I am not terribly informed about the details. Is there a way that I can help? And let the chips fall where they may. Um, because they may just say, absolutely, don't worry, we've got whatever coordinators. And, and that's part of what FEMA's response is, is insurance adjusters and administrative types to exactly do that, to facilitate the delivery of goods and services where there are none. So um, I would add that to the mix. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Thank you. All right. Jose? Hi, uh, my name is Jose Alfredo from Language Link. Um, I have two questions. The first one is um, let's say that uh, how, how can I be sure that I'm going to pick the right grant writer? Because, you know, the coin has two sides. We as business owners, we don't know the site that you, as a grant writer, know, correct? But you, as a, as, a, as a grant writer, you may not know the field that we are with. So you when know? you say grant writer, you're talking about proposal writer oh, slash proposal, grant proposal writer. writer. Yeah. How, how um, we, as a business owner, how can we, or is, is there any checklist that we can follow through when we interview and are you are we trying to select a grant writer because uh for us we need to we need to learn our needs you know we need to learn the language that you already know but mm -hmm. for you for instance you will need to learn all uh what my field and campus is and it has its own lingo as well so how how do you manage that as a grant writer well, the short version is we manage that very, very carefully because you're absolutely right. That is the key to whether you hire a proposal writer in-house, you know, he works for your company. How do you know he knows what he's doing? 
um, because you're going to rely on his expertise to be the, the missing piece to your puzzle, so to speak. And whether you have that new um, proposal writer in who might know everything about proposals, um, you know, but he may not know your discipline or your field, uh, your clients, um, because sometimes just, just doing the same thing for a different client can completely change uh, both the proposal and the services that are required. Um, and, and likewise, I mean, we here at Proposal Helper, that, that's what we do. So we are good at working with clients, but we don't expect them to know anything about proposals, and we don't expect them to know how to make us smart in their discipline. We have perfected the art of asking them the questions that matter and kind of working together. And it's different every time. Sometimes it's extremely easy. Uh, sometimes it's extremely difficult and, and everything in, in between. So it's a close collaboration in the truest sense of the word and sometimes it's easy and, and sometimes it's hard. Um, I found that even in the same field servicing the same clients um, businesses that have a, what, a separate culture uh, can be very much uh, very, very uh, they're more easy to work with than others who have a different culture um, and, and so yeah it, it is managed chaos and, and it is different every time. Um, it's not rocket surgery. I mean, it is professional people working toward a common goal. So obviously, the earlier you start in the process, the easier it is, the less pressure it is, and the better the final product uh, will turn out. My, my next question is uh, kind of towards what you were talking right now. Uh, so you guys in Proposal Helpers, instead of trying to, to um, for us, the members of GCA to hire you as a proposal writer. Are you guys willing to team work with us as well? With the GCA? Yeah, certainly. I, I don't see why we wouldn't be. Yeah, yeah, but with GCA members like me, like uh, myself, you know, I own a translation and interpretation agency and I am overwhelmed uh, for so much, so many uh, opportunities that are on the market. But, you know, I don't have the resources to hire a grant writer when I don't even know for, for sure if I hire somebody, I'm, I'm going to be awarded that, that, month, that contract, you know? Right. So that's a distinct decision. And, and just so you know, I used to be a linguist in the Army. That's how I got into contracting was um, serving as a program manager on some of the major language contracts in DOD. Um, and then, you know, after I had got into that, that's how I ended up here actually. But um, so I mean it's a it's a good question of how do you know right when you see it? And there's many ways of doing that. You can um, you can hire a consultant literally to help you map that out. If you're gonna hire internally you could hire a um, a headhunting agency, a talent agency that's gonna help you find and vet uh, people. If you look for a service like ours um, you'll find, you know, there is a, it's a different balance and depending on your situation it might or might not be the right answer. What we offer is, I would say, from a per proposal basis, uh, cost effectiveness. Because if you hire a proposal manager, in order for it to justify the salary, you have to win enough work, you know, to, to justify it all the entire year. And based on my understanding of your market, um, you can have a lot of competition, um, so you may not win. Uh, your odds of winning are probably not terribly high. Um, I mean, talking about for, for sizable projects, you know, for large projects that involve, you know, 25 or more um, personnel. <clears throat> so it's a it's a it's an analysis and a balance that that has to be struck. And there's no, in my opinion, there's no right answer. There are companies that, that I've worked with where it is a perfect fit. They align very well with our strengths and our weaknesses and strengths align perfectly and we make a, a unified team. Some of our clients are still new to us and we're still perfecting uh, our relationship. And certainly uh, the more proposals you do either both internally and with uh, external resources then the better the, the product is, the easier the work becomes. Um, proposals are by their very nature very repetitive. They tend um, to have the same dozen components inside them. Sometimes they're extremely complex, sometimes they're not. And rolling with that is, is easier over time. So I hope I answered your question. 
Yes, you did. So, so let me uh, address the, I think the question is also, does proposal helper work on a contingency basis? I guess that's what Jose was trying to get to, on a teaming basis or contingency basis. I do not believe that we do. That said, we are ourselves a small business, and so we are more adaptive than others. But like everyone out there who has a service that they want to sell, we have to strike a balance between accommodating our clients, current and, and new, and um, achieving enough revenue with the resources that we have. So I, I can't speak for the entire company. I'm not empowered to do that. But I would say that we take all potential clients seriously and will entertain any realistic um, offer. Um, for example, in the world of languages, it's a weird it's a weird field because on the one hand it, it's very specialized and compared to some things like say uh, IT it's very specialized and there's not a lot of competition that said in that constellation of of companies who do that work they know what the major clients are what the major contracts are and competition can be very steep and when you have companies whose win ratio is you know 1 out of 10 a contingency basis is an extremely dangerous, risky thing for a company like Proposal Helper. So, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, the uh, the I'm gonna address parts of that question. The one of the advantage of working with Proposal Helper is that it's not one person who's a proposal writer. They have you know uh, many many proposal uh, writers, and so based on the type of projects based off of the industry, they can match you with the right person that's most qualified to write your type of proposals. Mm -hmm. So that's one, one of the advantage of working with Proposal Helper. It's just not one person that's doing all the work for you. Uh, they have a whole team of different proposal writers with different skill set. If, if somebody's in IT, they have multiple people who's skilled with IT. If, if somebody is in a janitorial, they have different people that have more experience than that. And, and so, so it's not just one person that you're going to be working with. It may be a team of people. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the other difference is if you hire someone in-house, you're limited to that person's skill set. Mm -hmm. And so you're limited to that. Whereas proposal helpers, the way they work with is they have someone who is the proposal manager. They also have someone who is the proposal writer. So and sometimes this person may be the same, but most of the time you're working with a few different people and you have somebody else reviewing the work to make sure that it's done uh, right as well. So you have a few layers of support versus just one person with one skill set. And, and so, so that's one advantage. Now the way we work with proposal helpers is that we have a proposal program. And Scott, you don't know this here, but you know, this, I think this is something for you, you know, for you to find out also, surprise tonight. So. So the, way, so the way we work proposal helpers is we sell credits and so you as a member uh, you can choose to go outsource and hire your own proposal writer and that's one way of how you can do proposal writing. The other way is you learn how to write and that's the purpose of a proposal boot camp so that you can come and learn how to write and do your own response because you'll save a little bit of money but then that means you have to take on more as a business owner you have to take on more responsibility so it's just a matter of do you have more money or do you have more time? And if you have more time, learn to write for yourself. If you have more money, let the expert do what they're good at. And Scott, changing oil, car oil, mm -hmm. who changed their own car oil here? I don't think anybody's <laughs> in the room that I, And it's not, it's, it's cheap, but we pay someone else to do it because you know, somebody else is better at doing something like that. And so proposal writing is the same. If you can learn how to do it yourself, do it yourself. If you can outsource it, outsource it. If you can hire someone, hiring someone has a lot of pros, but also has some, you know, some drawbacks with that as well. And so we, so we sell credits, and the way we sell credit is you just buy, you're on a six-month commitment, and every month you pay a credit, same amount for six months, and then whether you use it or not, you have up to 18 months to use those credits. And so if you don't find anything that month, that's fine. Don't, no pressure wait until you find another project and you can stack up the credit that way. Interesting. I, I get kind of lost there. So, so for example, this is our proposal management um, support.
support here. So you have to agree to buy a minimum of six credits. And, and so there's a certain amount of, of deliverables. And then we will help you to source out, you know, review the, you find a project that you're interested in, we'll do a quick scan to make sure that you at least meet some of the key requirements. And if you don't, you know, I mean, you look at it first, because we can look at every single project to see if you qualify or not. You have to know if you qualify or not. But if you look at it and you say, hey, I, I think I'm qualified for this here, I can respond to it, then you use one of the credit and then we will write the proposal. And so instead of hiring someone on a monthly basis at, most proposal writers are very expensive. And mm -hmm. so at a minimum for a decent proposal writer, you're gonna pay about 60 to 70,000. And if you get a very good one, there's gonna be 80 to 90,000. If you get like a super seasoned one, they can be over 100,000. To hire uh, a proposal? No. Oh. To hire on your staff. Oh, okay, I got you. Yeah. So on this, this credit thing, yeah, I, I, I don't have my glasses on, but I can kind of tell these, like, these are leaving like close up. So I didn't think of that. <laughs> so $3,999, six credits. So within that six credit, I'm just trying to... Per credit. Out. Per credit. Per, per credit. So you're paying for $4,000 per credit? Per credit, yes. So what is a credit? What can, what is, can you get one proposal. So for each proposal, basically, so uh, that will be about what twenty four thousand dollars for for six credits. Six credits. Yeah. Okay. I'm just trying to make sure I understand. Yeah. So you can have you can get those six six of uh, uh you have to pay that three ninety nine per credit each time. Every no every month. Okay. And then you you whether you use a credit or not then. It stacks up. It goes into your into your into your credit bank, or and then you just use it whenever you find the right project. Yeah, up to eighteen months. Up to eighteen you months. You can use it in eighteen months, then you forfeit it. Yeah. Hopefully, you find something in I eighteen know, but months. I'm just saying, yeah, I don't think, yeah, but I'm just. And and this is for, and this is a way to kind of get started because the the way you you do this is you you get started. And, and with those six credits, you build up a portfolio of the type of projects that you're interested in. Now you have templates and so forth to do it on your own down the road. Uh, or you can continue to outsource the work and do it that way. This, is, make, this makes it more affordable for you to do it this way versus mm -hmm. hiring someone in-house. Okay, so with that being said, what's the difference in having these, uh, one of these credits and doing the boot camp? The boot camp, to what extent? What are you getting out of the boot camp that's going to be, just say for instance, if somebody wanted to come and just learn how to do it on their own? Well, it's, it would just be for somebody who don't have time to be bothered with basically themselves. Well, the yeah, biggest yeah. thing is what Abraham uh, just said was that when you do it yourself, you are counting on your own thing. Now, Shipley, uh, who has been training proposal writers for decades, I think it is now, um, they have a I can't remember. I attended one of their training sessions, which was three or four days straight, and mm -hmm. it's literally it's just an introduction, and it doesn't give you any of the value of experience because, like any profession, and and proposal writing is a profession, you learn a lot over the course of experience. Mm -hmm. If it was not that way, we wouldn't pay more for a guy with ten years of experience than we do for a guy with only two, uh, but we do. We pay a lot more for experience. So. It cannot be learned to the point where you can do everything in just a boot camp. Maybe over a series of years and combined with study and experience, et cetera. But even even if you could, like like Abe just said a minute ago, when at least with our service, you're not just getting the the proposal writer. In many ways, there's no single proposal writer. There is the proposal manager who's coordinating everything, getting a lot of the information. And yes, he does do much of the writing. We have uh, SMEs and other writers who will uh, take the material and, and actually compose it if required or adapt it if that's required. You'll have people who are working on the math and the cost and the price volumes. You'll have um, graphics people putting together the, the graphics that go up front. And it's all important because at the end of the day, this is sales. And sales is not simple. Um, it's 
it's related to marketing. So whether you if you you could have a very compelling proposal, and in some worlds, if it was just price, maybe you'd win with a lousy cover page. But in others where it's more value based, their impressions of you are going to be based on that cover photo, and having professional work, you know, pays off. Um, I don't know what the average company, because I think it varies a lot by their field and how many proposals they do, but your your percentage of win rate um, is an important factor. Ours is in the high 50s, low 60s, which is extremely high, because for any given contract, there's many um, bidders, and only one or two or three, a small number, will win. And so statistically, it's like baseball. Um, if you have a 500 average, that's very, very good, even though that means that you lose, you know, you miss half the time. So that's all part of the, the, the process. You have to understand that this is not a given thing. Um, it's not easily predictable. And in my opinion, to maximize the chances of your proposal, which represents a huge investment of time, both to write it and to learn how to write it, to get resources to write it, to do the research to find out whether or not that opportunity is good for you, a good fit, you got all that to invest. Um, it's important to do it right. So I I know a lot of people they believe in firing off as many proposals they possibly could. For my and that, and that is a strategy and it does work for some companies. For my part, I would uh, advise a more balanced approach of enough proposals to make up for the ones that you're going to lose, but not so many that you can't do a good job because quality matters. Okay. Any other questions? So, for those of you just joining us, uh, we've got Scott Hamilton here with Proposal Helpers. He's uh, helping us with office hours tonight. And if you have questions related to proposals, that's great. And if you have questions outside proposals, that's fine too. But uh, Henry. So, so what I understand is, is there a standard fee for writing proposal? You know, like you say, you go, go to a car place and then one said thirty nine ninety nine, and you go to another one. With the same car, they say a different price. Is it <laughs> standardization or is based on the company and the experience that they're providing for you? Well, that's a great question. And like every field, uh, you, you'll find all kinds of people out there offering all kinds of products and services for all kinds of different figures. Um, this is our approach, and I think it's compelling because. If, if, you, if you back off for a second and say, all right, who, who are the customers of proposal support? They are people and companies who don't know a lot about proposals. Sometimes they do. They just don't have the bandwidth, et cetera. But for most of them, it has to do with knowledge and expertise. So they are very poorly equipped to decide whether or not a price is good or not. And when in doubt, they might go for the lower one. Um, our approach is a firm fixed price, and my president is absolutely passionate about that being the price. It is not as low as some, it is lower than others. And that is for the entire proposal. Now proposals are weird because you could be in the middle of writing it and the government could come out and say, oh by the way, uh, I want a resume for all 27 people on the contract. Now your proposal requirements are much higher and many proposal companies charge you by the hour. So. You, if you don't, if you've never been on a proposal before, a thousand hours of proposal support sounds like a lot. Well, forty hours a week, yada yada, and they figure, okay, that should be plenty, and they don't realize that you could actually burn, you know, a thousand hours in two weeks. You, you know, with one or two people, that would not be a problem, and you would still have work for them to do at the end of each of those days. So. A lot of companies try to sneak you in with a low price up front, and then once you're in the middle of the proposal, they say, oh, you've run out of hours, and now they have to charge you for more. So your overall cost is a lot higher than you thought. So that's a factor, too. At the end of the day, I would look at your peers in the industry, find out what they do, and I would follow their lead. I would look around and find a company that a, a company supported and ask their opinion. Did you like the support? And I wouldn't worry about the win because the win, people focus on the win when they shouldn't. A perfectly good proposal written by a very competent proposal writer uh, can lose. 
and you will not know why they lost. Everyone will say it's not their fault, etc. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. It's difficult to determine. But what, at the end of the day, you should be able to look at the material. They should be able to present to you materials that look professional. They should look like other proposals that you've seen in other places. They should be able to answer your questions. And they should have the resources involved because there's no sense committing to a company to help you if they're not going to be able to help you if there's a bump in the road. That's just, uh, I mean, you could do it, but uh, it's not how I would do it if it was my company. Okay. Uh, is it Scott? Is this Scott? Mm -hmm. Scott Carmichael, I have one question for you. Do yes, you guys charge, um, like, take a percentage of the, uh, like, the, uh, the amount of the contract? One? No, sir. No, no, you don't do that? No, nope. if it was a $200 million contract with hundreds of employees in four states, we would charge you the same as if it was a smaller contract. Um, it's, it's had nothing to do with that at all. And that's kind of the merit of us because some companies um, are just impractical for small bids. Some companies can only do small bids. We have the bandwidth and the experience to do both, and we're, we're scalable in that if you look at a hiring a proposal writer in-house, for example, or, or even a proposal staff, their maximum capacity, if you did the math of their salary and their benefits, <laughs> et cetera, and all the, the computers you have to pay for and all that stuff, you know, we're cheaper than that and we can do as many or more proposals per year than, than they could. And we have the ability to adapt ourselves, as, as Abe was saying a little while ago, to the task at hand to a much greater extent than an individual can. I mean, sometimes they can because they, they by luck, have done something similar. But sometimes um, they encounter something they haven't seen before. My, my, my peer, my colleague, Carolyn, and I, combined, I, I think we've got 35 years of experience or something like that, and we work together all the time, and we often see things we have not seen before, um, either because the RFP is so messed up <laughs> or sometimes just because um, – just some little nuance that, that's new to us. So it's a complex business. So I hate I hate to be non-committal. I like to give straightforward, simple answers, but okay. this is a field that's not not set up for that. And do you have like a price range or an estimate? If I give you an industry or I don't know, like a price range? Yeah. So so if you got like a project that you you're interested in proposal writer to help you with. What you want to do is you want to let them know. So, so there's two ways of how you how how you get proposal helpers to help you. One is you say, hey, here's a project, give me an estimate, and then they give you a fixed price, and then that's what it's going to cost. Or the other is you you work with us and we put you on our credit program, and you just buy credits, and then they will work with you based on the credits and the credits are predetermined in, in advance so that you know what your cost is for the next six months. So there's a few ways of how you work with them. Okay. So Scott is partnering with GCS. Yes, yes. We, yeah, we're working with the helpers so that we can kind of create a program so that it's, you know, manageable and affordable for some of the smaller businesses to get into it. Now if a business is established and they're they're doing fifty million dollars a year, then this is not the program for them. Okay. This is this is a way for newer, smaller businesses to kind of be able to get proposal writing support and be at a fixed cost and know that they don't have to hire a proposal writer in-house because they're not quite ready to do that. I did want to answer his question, or at least the one that you wrote down. So, no, we do not take a percentage of the contract award um, as a general rule. Okay. All right, thank you, Scott. But, but they will take any bonuses you give them. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> take those checks payable to greedyscott.com. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the thing is, basically, there is no template, no one template for this based on what you can. Because all the, all the proposals are going to be written differently depending on what the industry is and what it is a person is. The type of award. No. Yes. There's a lot of factors involved in writing a proposal. One is the agency dictates the type of response, right? So if it's at a, at a state level, most states, they, they may want it, uh, they're, they're going to want it lowest, lowest price. 
they, they're going to ask you to submit um, three documents or five, five copies. They're going to ask you to drop it off. Some of them won't allow you to email it. Uh, and so everybody dictates how they want it. You know, some of it is, uh, you know, it's going to have a requirement that for something very simple, it might be 50 pages. <laughs> something super complex, but all they want is a, a seven-sheet document. So, it's, it's, so it varies from project to project. Now, at the federal level, it's more consistent because federal agencies tend to hold to the same format. But but cities, counties, states, federal, they all have their own way of what they're looking for. So it depends on your industry. It depends on the agency and, and how, how you're going to have to prepare for it. I'd like to make a, a brief plug for uh, Proposal Helpers also getting into business development. So we're helping clients build a pipeline, establish a strategic plan, uh, and, ident and fill that pipeline with opportunities that will support that plan. And that takes into account external things like what agencies and clients out there that they sell that they could sell to but also their approach to acquisitions you know do are they you know if a company has a GSA schedule is that agency do they often use GSA for example you know those are important considerations and in my experience a lot of the difficulties that happen during a proposal they come from long before the proposal started they, they come with the the, the company has to know the services. I mean, we can help with that, and we, we we charge additional, you know, if we have to find an expert in, I don't know, fixing x-ray machines. Um, we can we can find that, but, you know, we, we charge extra for that. A basic proposal, we tend to rely on the company to know its business, and that also means they have to know the client, too, because as we know, when one government agency says that they want a thing, they may mean something different, a little or a lot, from another agency. So it's a teamwork thing, but somebody has to know the answers to those questions. All right. Other questions? Yeah, I guess I was just thinking, like, with, um, I was going to go for the uh, county uh, about three years ago, so that their uh, RFP for medical, you know, for medical supplies, a company that did medical supplies for the county. And then I'm just trying to see if this is similar to because I'm thinking they had they already had a document like it was about, it probably was about 65 pages. With that, that was, I'm sure that was a proposal. I'm thinking the only thing is to be honest with you on that side of it. I was so new until I kind of got a little intimidated <laughs> <laughs> when I printed it out and started to look at it, and then I. Didn't find out about it until like probably about a week before it was due, mm. and so I played around with it a little bit. Yeah. Not with the intentions of turning it in because it took time to research companies and make sure you can provide the product that they actually needed. Mm -hmm. But I guess my question, uh, my statement, a question is: Was that something similar? Is that what they put out like for the counties, the different counties, something that's kind of like a proposal? Yeah. Uh, would you have need, need something in addition to that? Well, fortunate for you and your industry, Jacqueline, mm -hmm. medical equipment, medical supplies, and so forth, most of the time it's going to be more of a bid or quote type of situation. Mm -hmm. So so very rarely will uh, you have to put a proposal together. Now, the few times where you do have to put a proposal together is mm -hmm. when you actually, they might be looking for a, a some type of multiple award task order contract or IDIQ or blanket purchase agreement or something like that to where they're trying to choose five companies or six companies or ten companies who's always on standby so whenever they need medical supplies and medical equipment they can just you know let those two companies bid on those projects right. and so in that type of decision you will have to write a proposal and that, and that might be like a five-year contract but then when and then when they do need something, you're only bidding against two or three companies, and not all of them will even bid. And so, so you have a better chance of winning. And so, in your industry, when it comes to equipment and supplies, most of the time it's going to be a bid or a quote. So you don't have to worry as much about proposals as other people. Service industries, you know, like language services, you're going to have to, you know, when you're dealing with small projects, it's a quote type of situation. But when you're dealing with uh, like the largest language service contract I saw was seven billion dollars. It was a huge contract for I think ten years with the DoD, 
Uh, and is that, so, is that delight? Uh, I forget what it was, uh, but that was like the last go around. So the new go around, I don't remember what it is now. So, hmm. but see, like with AA though, you get you open. You you you're not just doing medical supplies. You can go out with anything that's out there. Yeah, if you're going after service contract, then right. be prepared to write proposals. Yes. Right. But if you're using sole source, you don't necessarily have to. You're not competing in writing proposals to compete. And so, so your proposal is not the same proposal as if you're competing based on the requirements that they normally put out. You're, they're just gonna say, okay, hey, you know, your proposal is very simple. They say, hey, I want you to do this. Some, something yeah. Basic and so you're putting together a very simplified proposal response on a sole source. And, and in that type of situation, again, you're, you're not competing in the open market. So it's easier that way as well. All right, so I've got Deborah online. Deborah, you got any questions? I'm gonna unmute you. Hello, hello, Deborah. Yes, I'm here. I, I came in at the in the middle, so I was just following along. Okay. So Deborah had a few things that she wanted. She had some questions tonight, and um, I think let me see if I can find her question. I can pull up her, her email. So Deborah had a few questions that's not related to proposal, but uh, I wanted to kind of address it with everybody. So this is good learning for you guys as well. So Deborah is working on her website. Mm -hmm. And so she, she asked the question is, hey, I, I wrote this little description about my company and can you give me some feedback on it? So that was her question. Her company is called NG Resources, and so this is this is her her uh, description about her company here. So, NG Resources is a global innovative janitor facility maintenance service. Uh, we deliver high quality services and and provide competitive pricing that simplifies acquisitions needs for the government and public. We stand by our reputation of having integrity, loyalty, and hard workers. We continuously learn, develop, and improve. We build on our successes and learn from our failures. Our goal is to provide a business with an environment that is safe, functional, and clean for their employees and their clients. All right, so anybody has some feedback for her? I'm going to paste it here, and then we're going to actually... What is she going to have to she, this is a little description of her company to put right. on her website. Oh, so and so she asked for you know some feedback, and so I'm gonna make it open. Some of you guys are good writer. We got Scott, who's a who's a great writer as well. And then we, but I think it's a little choppy. But uh, let's go ahead and critique and tweak it to help her a little bit. Hey, Abe, can I ask one question? I'd like to know how much space does she have to work with? Because that drives a lot of what I would have to offer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Deborah, how much space do you have? Um, I was trying to keep it to a minimum because I just wanted to be direct, straight to the point. Mm -hmm. I didn't want it to be long, you know, like a page. I'm on board. I, I love this. I was this just trying already. to keep it in, in like, to, you know, just keep it simple, direct, so that they can truly understand, you know, mm -hmm. get what I'm saying. Can I say something? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, the first things that I've noticed, I've noticed the word um, we maybe five times. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's good. It's really good and interesting, but it's more self-centered instead of being more client-oriented. So you have to find a way to combine the we and the you or the client, mm -hmm. and uh, you can also uh, make sure you highlight the value that you bring to the client in, a, in a, the statement. Okay, so it's about perspective, because when you're addressing um, on your website, you can address it by you telling them about you, or you can address it from them coming to your site and say, 
and letting them read as if they're viewing it for themselves from the you perspective versus from the us perspective. So, so how you're saying you saying change we to you? No, no not necessarily. No. You, you can combine some of the we's and turn into you or something like that. Yeah, so so for example, uh, yeah. Instead of saying that we deliver, it's the high quality services say, let me rephrase it for that. Mm -hmm. I can barely hear me. We're going in and out. You can say something as you can say as we can come to look to learn and develop and improve. Energy resources is a global network territorial facility and it services delivering high quality services and providing competitive pricing that simplifies acquisition. <laughs> now you turn into Maybe. a run off sentence now. Yes, <laughs> Sure. So, so can you replace the we with the in a couple spots and kind of break up the we, 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 we? No, it's it's pretty much the, the same thing. Still it's still, still the we. It's company name, so it's in a high quality services to provide competitive pricing that can provide acquisition needs to the government. Uh, All right, so, so those are some good feedback. Um, I'll, I'll help you off. Uh, you know, Deborah offline, um, but yeah, but those are some good feedback here. And so your second question is um, your vision. So let's talk about your vision. Scott, any feedback on her her uh, little write up here first before we go into her vision? Um, yes and no. So I, I mean, I certainly could. I could try to make what's there better, and I have some suggestions. Um, and I do agree with the we thing, and mm -hmm. but the the key is, if you go down a supermarket aisle and you look at boxes, they are speaking not just to people but to specific people, and sometimes it can be very clever about it. Um, so I would say, in your vision, it looks like you're you're you're. I can see who you're trying to sell to better in your vision. Top-notch facility, right? That tells me like a hospital because I mean everyone wants their facility to be clean but a hospital cares a lot and not just about the way it looks they care about bacteria things you can't see a hotel they care about things you can see and <laughs> maybe maybe less the things that you can't see so sure. <laughs> I would incorporate all of that in here for example when I think jan janitors I think about the guy going through my office at night and him maybe stealing my wedding ring that I left on my desktop <laughs> when I went home. So mm -hmm. now that's just me. I may not be like your client. And your job is to know your client and know, in my opinion, what they're afraid of and what they want. The fight or flight are the things we desire and the things that we fear. And that's what I would talk to. Our people are all thoroughly checked or whatever, you know, to basically say that our, our employees are reputable, etc. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Things like that that talk to those to that fear, for example. That's that's how I would change it. And in my opinion, if you can speak to people directly, they will look past the many weaves that you have in there, and they'll look past at the fact that you're talking about yourself because you're talking about something that they're interested in. <clears throat> and that's really the trick: is if you can talk about something someone is interested in, they'll forgive you everything else. That's my opinion. Yeah, good feedback. She, gained, she would be gaining that confidence, mm -hmm. you know, through what she's putting in. I was trying to think about the word, you know, because I always, and I can't believe I can't remember it now, but like when you're hiring people to come in and do cleaning and to do certain things, you want to make sure that, what's that word? Bond it, insure it. Bond it, and mm -hmm. insure it. That may be something that, you know, that you want to put in there. That yeah. Because people look for that, I do. Mm -hmm. If I let somebody in my house, I need to feel like I got some kind of way to come back at them or something wrong. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's look, let's look at her vision statement. So vision statement, top-notch facility maintenance central service that transform an office cleaning facility pre- and post-construction cleanup to an upscale feel, transform residential properties into a resort-like experience, and provide high quality and low cost to meet business owners' need meeting the needs of businesses, partners, individuals, and the community by 
customer retention, so source, collaborating with partners, leading the way with opportunities for others to succeed, and having a powerful brand name, building adaptive leadership community service. Yeah, I think that we became that we needed and need some business. And then she just uh, talked about transform and transform residential properties into resort like experience and provide high quality and low cost to me. Somehow another thing like they're saying the same thing they run into in the same sense is that either she needs to figure out how to combine that, that or get rid of one of the because they're coming together to see the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For me <clears throat> I would say it's it's good. It's a little bit long. Mm -hmm. But it is more a mission than a vision. Mm -hmm. It is more a mission statement than a vision. Yeah, I can see a, that. A vision has to show where you want to go and what do you want to be in the next couple of months or years. But I, I don't see that. There. Yeah. Deborah, did you go through the PowerPoint I sent you? Some of it, not all of it. Okay, yes. I put a lot of good examples of vision statements in there. And usually when you're coming up with your vision statement, you want it to keep it very succinct and short um, and and powerful in that way. This is, I think, uh, Carmichael, what he shared is more accurate, that this is more of a mission um, than it is your vision. But go through the PowerPoint I sent you and look at the examples. You know, I put like you know, multiple examples in there and look through what they have. And then also do a Google search for uh, vision statements for uh, cleaning companies and janitorial facility support companies out there to see what, what you can learn from some of those. And then yeah, that's where I got some of it. That's where I got some of that from, from the Google search okay. of the janitorial yeah. facility maintenance. Okay, go through the PowerPoint I sent you first. I think yours will probably have a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. I specifically go through, you know, how to create a vision statement uh, and the difference between a mission and a vision statement and so forth. Correct, yeah. All right, so uh, one time for one more question and then it's going to be a wrap. Diana, you got you're, you haven't asked any questions yet, so we'll give the, uh, the, the mic over to you to see if you have any questions. About proposal or anything you want. Scott is still on the phone. Scott's still on here, uh-huh. Scott, my question oh, yeah. is, hi, I'm Deanna with Grace Management Group. Uh, I would like to know what kind of non-disclosures you have. You said you have multiple people on your team. What kind mm -hmm. of non-disclosures would we be facing if we register with your company? I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't hear your question clearly. You were asking about the resources on our team, but I lost the rest. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat the question for you. Uh, should Diani and her company engage proposal helpers to write proposals for her company? What type of non-disclosure, what type of, of um, protection does she have to ensure that her information, her pricing model, her methodologies, her, her business you know, secret recipe uh, will be kept um, you know, safe? Uh, in the hands of you guys supporting her writing proposals. Okay, so that's a great question. So yes, well, we we at the corporate level we find we um, will will sign an NDA not not to share and to you know protect protect your information. Um, so you have that that um, rather formal commitment. We, internally, we have a variety of processes that we use to ensure that that happens. For example. Um, one proposal coordinator is working on a, a proposal with a company and he has no idea that anyone else might be working on a proposal for a competitor for the same thing or not we we just don't know we don't we don't share what we're working on or who we're working on it with with our peers just because we want to preserve that firewall to protect our clients um, so there's that and behind these processes and agreements which are great I mean they're, they're industry standard and they're as good as you'll find anywhere um, but behind that is the commitment of our team and our president leads the way and she's passionate about protecting our, our clients uh, information proprietary information their pricing all of those things because they, they are keys to your business and we understand that and respect that that need does it help 
Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, and see, part of it is it doesn't matter if it's proposal helpers or somebody that you hire internally for your own company or or any uh, any other company that you outsource you know, support to. There is a level of comfort, a level of trust, and so you don't just jump into any type of relationship. You talk to them a few times. Uh, you you have them sign an NDA, but you still have to use your gut instinct and. And if something doesn't feel right, something doesn't smell right, then yeah, it, it's probably something. Something's probably is not going on right there. So, so, so it's just using your business instinct and your and your you know all the talents that God's giving you to see if somebody's going to do you right or not. You know, Delta Force has a saying that if it feels wrong, it is wrong. And generally, I think they know what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah. And Scott, how about you work on the same proposal for two different clients? Uh, as an individual, we would never do that. Hmm. So let's you Deborah, right? Diani. Diani. Diani send the same proposal and I'm I'm your client as well and I send the same project. So our president as Abe said, we have there's more to us than just the proposal coordinator or proposal manager that you see. Behind that person is a whole team and part of it is our management team and our management team assigns proposals to coordinators and at their level where they don't actually touch their proposals they they know who's doing what and so they know that let's say it's to go after uh, an NSA contract and, and I'm working with ABC Corporation and then you come along going after the same contract for, for the NSA uh, vehicle, then they would assign that to someone else, and if there was no one else, they would tell you, we're very sorry, but we don't have someone, or they would go and find someone else, but they would never, ever allow the same person to work on it. I mean, e like one of the things that we do is with our extended team is we have others review our work, you know, because you, it's very difficult to review your own work. You don't see your own mistakes. That's why they're so hard to see. That. That's why you have such things as editors. We won't let one editor edit. Um, proposals for the same bid with different companies or anything like that. So the firewall is complete. I'm I'm not. That is a concern, but I'm not too concerned about it. And here's here's what I mean by that. Uh, in the event that there is a situation with two, you know, they have two clients going after the same project. One is just what Scott said. You know, they're, you know, they're they've got lots and lots of proposal writers, and so they're not going to, you know, they can make sure that the same proposal writer is not writing with two people, where they're not writing one and then just changing the name on there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but the way you win contracts is you have your own methodology, you have your own pricing, and so there's so much things that's unique about each company that even though the proposal, uh, the 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 proposal, the request for proposal, the solicitation might ask for the for one one thing, but the way you you address that is addressed very differently. And so you know, I, I, I'm never you know worry about that. But you know, it's a good concern. But like I deal with that from time to time. Like I have uh, you know, I coach different businesses in in the coming market, and a few of them will say, hey, if you're coaching me in IT and you have another company that's in IT, uh, when we're both interested in the project, how are you going to coach us? And and my answer is, one is, if both of you are interested in the same project, first I'm going to disclose to you that, hey, I have another company that's interested in the same project. I can still coach you through this project for uh, full disclosure. And if you still want to go after it, I'm going to position you so that you can be in the best position to win. And the other company, they're going to, I'm going to position them, so that, but I'm not going to disclose your information. That's why you know, we have a, a confidentiality agreement with all of our uh, businesses, same thing, non-disclosure confidentiality with what Scott and them are doing. So I, I, I don't think it'll be an issue. Um, but, but again, you just have to see if you can trust the people to start off with. Yeah. All right, so I think that's all the time we have. Scott, thank you so much uh, for uh, being part of the office hours tonight. For all of you that uh, that's here tonight, if you've got a small taste of Scott and you haven't registered for the proposal boot camp, it's coming up this weekend, Friday morning from 8.30, and 9, I think 8.30 is registration, 9 o'clock is the event. It's going to go to about 4.30, 5 o'clock, uh, Friday and Saturday, both days. 
And if you haven't gone to Proposal Bootcamp yet, it's, you're in for a lot of good information. And we're also going to have some fun activities, uh, a, a, uh, a game during the session. You, can you believe it? There's games in Proposal Writing. So, so we'll have a game for you. We're going to provide lunch. And so we've got a, a half of companies coming to it. If you haven't registered, you're interested, please come to it. It's $6.99 for all of the members who are part of the association. And if you have friends uh, or other, other guests that wants to come, uh, if you're registering two people, we'll do the second person half price. Just let us know. Scott, any final closing remark from you uh, before we wrap up here? Uh, just thank you for having me. I, I really enjoyed it. I thought there was some really great questions, and uh, it, it was really, really fun. So thank you. All right. Hey, thanks so much for being our, our, our host, our guest tonight, and I look forward to seeing you on Friday. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to it. All right. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.